I became interested in um, Harry Eddy actually was through her mentor, James L. Gillis. Nine years ago, I was invited by a British publisher to write a book um, called Local Community in the Era of Social Media and Technologies. And then the, the topic of the book is about how you bring your local communities to the wide world. And then I chose, I selected three historical figures, um, J uh, John Muir, uh, Hubert Bancroft, and then James L. Gillis. And I was very impressed at the time by what he had done to California State Library and the libraries in California. And then in 2018, I was writing um, a paper for Emerald Insight for um, providing sub library services for all ages. And now I picked up where I left beh behind before and I continued my research on James, uh, uh, James Gillies. And then I, Happened to discover his assistant, two capable assistants, Laura Stephens and also Harriet Eddy. And I was, I really admire what she has um, done. And I also, I was very, very um, impressed with the uh, unified county library system. So um, two, 25 years ago, I left UC Berkeley to relocate to Santa Cruz. And I started to work for Santa Clara County Library. And afterwards, I started to work for Santa Cruz Public Library. So what really happened is I ended up with two county library systems. And then I just realized a lot of its advantages and also, a solid foundation. It was not as shaky as the like city or town libraries. We had some uh, economical crisis, say in 2000, um, 2004, and then the city of Salinas had to close its library system in 2005 because they tried to shorten the 12 million shortfall. So, so closing the library will enable them to save $7 million of this shortfall. And that by comparison, the two, system, two systems I was working for had none of those problems. I mean, we had some temporary layoff, but we didn't take that kind of a drastic measure. So again, I feel appreciative of the advantage of a unified county library. And then, so I, at this point, I just said, I'm very kind of uh, impressed with both Gillies and also Eddie who implemented this great vision in her tenacious efforts. So I think at, at this point, we probably can um, start our slide, and then we can provide some background information on both James L. Gillies and the, uh, Harry G. Eddy. The next, please. So this, yeah, um, this, um, the, uh, first of all, we will see the libraries in California before 1899. I think Dr. Buckland mentioned about a lot of changes occurred after 1900. The mis so this is before 1900, you will see um, California State Library at that time was closed to the public. It was established in 1850. It was close to the general public. Only the state officials could use the library collection and the services. 
And the California State Library at that time had a very limited interactions with other libraries in California. And at that time, the old political patronage prevailed in pro appointing state librarians or hiring staff at California State Library. And then you can see <clears throat> California State Library at that time developed no library services for its residents. And there were few text-based municipal and town libraries before 1900. And there was no county library system in and outside California. Uh, in other states, especially in the uh, East and the Midwest states, there were some um, county library services, but not the system. And also there was no library school in California to provide library education and the training. The next please. And then you will see this are the eight, eight California state libra librarians before James Gillis. They, have, um, they are uh, all appointed either by governor or through political patronage. So we have Stratton, Johnson, Cravens, Wallace, Foreman, Matthews, McCabe, McCabe and the Combs. The next please. And then this is James L. or Louis Gillis. He is the ninth California State Librarian from um, 1899 to 1917. And this portrait was taken around 1921. Next, please. Now we will talk a little bit about James um, Gillis. He was born in 1857 and passed away in 1917. He is the first state librarian to be appointed by the five member State Library Board of Trustees. He used to work for Southern Pacific Railroad and he was retired as assistant superintendent after his 22 years service. And he designed a unified and a collaborative county library system founded in every county of California to provide three major goals, services. One is economical, equal, and a complete library service. For the state library, he modernized the, uh, the library by opening its door to all California residents. He managed to get the law changed in 1903 so that other than people other than state officials could use California State Library's collection and the services. He also transformed into a leader of California libraries by providing publications, conferences, library services, and the programs. Next please. For the State Library, Gillies also enhanced a succession of library, new library services, such as 1903's Traveling Library Program, 1905's Books for the Blind Division, and 1905 for the Municipal Town Library Organizers. He added some more departments to the State Library, like law, legislative and the municipal reference, reference, cataloging, California, documents, extension. For the first time in California's library history, he depoliticized and professionalized library, California libraries and the librarianship into a new choose civil service system. Next please. And for the, the education part, he piloted a six month unpaid apprenticeship to fend off incompetent and untrained applicants. He improved library education and qualifications. So in 1914, he established 
the first library school at the state library. And he also approved circular of information for applicants for certificates of qualifications to hold the office of county librarian in California. So that means if you want to be a county librarian or library director, you need to pass those seven requirements to get certified. So those seven requirements are education, library service, knowledge of library conditions, executive ability, your personality, oral and the written discussion, and the final certification. So with, for the time being, we will stop um, to continue with our main character, Harry G. Eddy. Harry G. Eddy was born in 1876. She was not a California by birth, but a transplant from Lexington, Michigan. And she was the second daughter of George Washington Eddy and Louise McKenzie. Her, um, she had an elder sister called Myrta, and we will um, know a little bit more about her later on. So Eddie received a BA degree in 1896 from Albion College. She worked as a Latin teacher at her former Adrian High School. And she enrolled in a master's program at the University of Chicago. But in April 1903, she decisively withdrew from the university and shipped all her belongings to Elk Grove, California to join her sister, Murder and her brother-in-law, Ralph. And before joining her sister and her brother-in-law, she actually went over abroad to Europe to travel for three months. She visited two large cities in Germany, Hamburg and Frankfurt. She taught history and the Latin at the Helena High School in Montana from 1903 to 1906, and became head of the English department. Next, please. And in 1906, Eddie applied for an opening position from uh, Elk Grove Union High School. And she, she got the job and became the principal. The, uh, the interviewers were very important with this very young, bright, and a brave applicant, because this is what they need to transform a poor performed Elk Grove Union High School then. And that they were not disappointed in their expectations. By the end of the second year, Eddie managed to en enable the senior class of four students to be accredited by the university examiner. Because before that, all the students had to go to Sacramento for the fifth year to be accredited. So this time, for the first time, they didn't have to. And then in 1907, she doubled the school attendance and added two teachers. So in 1908, she wanted to apply for a credit, accreditation for her school. But there's a catch. It required it to have a library on campus, which Eddie couldn't afford. She didn't have the budget. So in September 1908, Eddie wrote to Gillis, a state librarian, for a large batch of books from the traveling library program. But she was told to apply for a branch instead of the Sacramento County Library in Elk Grove. So on October 19th, 1908, just like a month later, the first branch of the first county library in California was inaugurated in a hallway at the high school. In March, 1908, the Elk Grove Library was moved to a bigger space because it all grew itself. So it moved to the hall of Women's Christian Temperance Union 
At that time, 80% of Elka Group residents were library users. That's really a quiet achievement. The next, please. Now we will talk a little bit about California Library Association meetings in 1909. This is a watershed or turning point for both California libraries and for Harriet Eddy. This conference was held in 1908 from April 15th to April 17th, 1909 in Oakland, California. And the at this meeting, California libraries officially kicked off a decades-long transformation from municipal and town libraries into county libraries. Also at the conference, Eddie joined California Library Association as a new and a lifetime member. She was involved in the association ever since. Eddie accepted Gillies offered to become the first county library organizer. The next please. And there are two kinds of um, organizers in the history of California library history. The first one is the municipal town library organizer. At that time in 1905, I think this is also because James Gillies um, initiative uh, he's put, created two library organizers to send to the field to advise, to encourage and assist local communities to build their own public libraries with organizers' expertise on library methods, collections, and the buildings. Those two um, organizers are Bertha K. Comley and the Mabel E. Prentice. And that they made such, they achieved so much that by October 1907, they helped to establish 26 town and municipal libraries. They continued as municipal town library organizers until 1909 when Eddie replaced them as the first county library organizer. So the second library organizer is called County Library Organizer. It was a newly created position at the California State Library. Next slide, please. And now what is the County Free Library? And how can we get the free library in our county? Those are the two questions often asked and prepared by Laura Stephens. She was the second assistant librarian and head of extension we mentioned early. And she is one of the two capable assistants of Gillies. So what is the county free library? According to Laura, a county free library is a free library which is supported by the county and which gives service to every resident of the county. It uses the county as the unit with headquarters at the county seat and the branches in all parts of the county. And this is where municipal and the town libraries failed to do. And the second question is how can we get a county free library in our county? There are four steps. The first one is to adopt a resolution of intention. The second is publish the notice of intention which we have to publish three times so as to cover the time period of two weeks. And the third step is adopt a resolution of establishment. And then the fourth and the last is appoint a county librarian who has been certified by the board of library examiners we mentioned early about the seven requirements. The next please. And there are also major laws supporting county library. The first one is the, um, this is the law at that time, Gillies and the Sacramento Public Librarian Ripley used to establish the first county library when county library 
laws were not in place. In this a municipal library laws, statute of 1901, section 10 and the chapter 170, it allows the county board of supervisors to contract a library within the county to extend its library service to the rural areas. Because at that time, California had a more residents outside the city limits than within. And the second law is the 30th session of 1909 legislature. It consisted of 13 section um, acts to provide county library um, systems. It was passed on April 12th, 1909. And this law was flawed and it was very controversial, especially it's section two and 11 and that which we were mentioning the, the, the last 1911 county library law. This law is um, known for its simplicity and the clarity. This law was passed on um, February 25th, 1911 in both the Senate and the Assembly in the 39th session of the state legislature. The confirmed establishment of county library by supervisors, not election, as in 1909 law, and tax only on areas where there was no library instead of tax on entire county, as in the 1909 law. And the tax shouldn't exceed one mil on the dollar. Next, please. So now we will come to the experience of Harry Eddy at the State Library. So in September 1909, Eddy report present herself at the State Library, not without trepidation, because she was, she, she was thinking she knew how to teach, but how to organize an entirely new library system in the state of California, that's quite a challenge. But her mentor or supervisor Gillis told her, it would be teaching just the same. You will tell people about county library branch in Elko Grove and get a supervisor to vote the money to establish it. Gillis also helped Eddie to shape her work habits and the routine as in the following six areas. One is preparing with the basic information on the county. And the second is contacting the right people. Third is obtaining all meeting schedules and the travel timetables. Fourth is making friends, especially with people working in hotels and the transportation. And the being friendly with media, going to newspapers always with a written story about her meetings. And the sixth and the last is complete work, paperwork on time. She wrote daily reports to Gillies and keeping very detailed accounting to her receipts and expenses. Next, please. And the, what Ellie had achieved at the State Library between 1909 and 1917, she visited all 58 counties in California from 1909 to 1917. She organized 40 county libraries out of 50, 58 counties. She encountered numerous obstacles and the difficulties, such as the localism in Santa Cruz. And here is a little bit local ties um, related to our Santa Cruz County libraries. She came to Santa Cruz and they tried to organize the, the first county library under 1909 law. And then she got a lot of support, like the president of Santa Cruz uh, City Library Board and also city librarian, Minerva Waterman and the other libraries in the Bay Area. So she was pretty confident and went to Watsonville and didn't realize where Watsonville actually 
had no intention of being part of Santa Cruz system. So finally, when everything failed, she came back and then she talked to um, and the, uh, the president of Santa Cruz Library Board, Sam Leask uh, Senior, and they decided to give up for the time being to reroute. But ironically, Santa Cruz County was later, the library was uh, established a few years later because of people's demands. They just, they had to contract Santa Cruz City Library to um, established county library without Watsonville as part of it. And in addition to this kind of a localism, that she also met lack of interest in remote and the beautiful wine counties. Um, it took her seven years to establish Calusa County Library, 16 years for Marin County, 60 years for Napa County, and then 35 years for Sonoma County, which was actually um, established because of UC agricultural extension um, reminder. And of course, we, Eddie also had a success stories. The, uh, Santa Barbara County uh, was her first success story in 1909 after the failure in Santa Cruz. And in your county, she endeared herself to the important person, um, uncle, the, the uncle and the aunt of her classmates. And then the, the last one is the Ventura County. So if you read the book, you will see it was pretty um, eventful. Okay, next slide. And this um, picture is the president of Santa Cruz City Library Board, Sam Leask Senior. He was very sympathetic and understanding of the problems and the difficulties um, Eddie was faced with. The next one. And this Santa Cruz City Librarian, Minerva Waterman, she was um, visiting the, the, uh, the area because there was a request for a library um, to be established in Seabra area. The next one, please. And uh, here comes a very hot year, 1917. Uh, on April 6, 1917, the United States declared war against Germany. And on July, 27th, 1917, Gillis collapsed and died of a heart attack. On September 13th, 1917, the first US soldiers, soldier was killed. And then suddenly California became war aware. So any adventures or ventures related, unrelated to war efforts were not interested. And then counties with previous promise to establish county libraries were suddenly non unresponsive. And the four counties that had a county library established already, but not with no tax levied, levied were also delayed. The next one, please. So what did Eddie do after Gillies? In July 1918, Julie took a one year's leave from California State Library to join the faculty of UC Agriculture Extension, teaching as a home demonstration leader. In 1919, she resigned from California State Library when the leave of absence expired. In June 1941, Eddie retired from UC Agriculture Extension. Next, please. And this is a staff photo of Harry G. Addy at a UC Agriculture Extension, 1939. Next one, please. And in addition to be a teacher, a principal, 
ahead of the department and the um, county library organizer, Harry G. Eddy was also an activist. She was active in library peace organizations such as California Library Association, Women's International League of Peace for Peace and Freedom. And even in retirement, she was active in organizations for peace, like uh, the Peninsula Council of the American Soviet Friendship, the World Peace Congress, the National Peace Conference. Next, please. And in addition to the ones we mentioned early, Eddie was also an avid traveler. In 1906, she went to Europe to travel in Germany and the other countries. And in 1927, she was invited to the former Soviet Union to serve its library system and a training program formalized by Lenin's wife in Leningrad. And this program was based on Swiss American system. And from April to August, 1927, she visited libraries and reported her findings and the recommendations to the Commissar of Education. From in Leningrad, Eddie met Lenin's wife, Eddie Lenin's uh, wife and the other leading librarians. And in late November, 1930, she was invited back to Soviet Union to teach at the Library Science Institute in Moscow. She and her sister Murda traveled very extensive then. And after the Second World War, Eddie traveled to several Eastern Bloc countries, such as Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, and Czechoslovakia to consult on their national library systems. On April 3rd, 1952, Eddie's international travels suddenly came to an end with her passport retained in the State Department's files. The reason is because of her um, travel too frequent to the uh, Soviet Union and the other Eastern European countries. And then now we examine what survives after Gillies and Eddie, the state how state library fares. And Aristotle told us that if you will understand anything, observe its beginning and its development. And so we will do that. Uh, in California, library as a unit is an established institution to all 58 counties. Hand in hand with those county libraries are city or town libraries. The library services have been involved and the change to reach all corners of the state. And the two collaborative programs are still in use, Interlibrary Loan and the Union Catalog, which has also gone through an evolution and finally succeeded by or continued by OCLC, an online computer library center. And the library school, state library school, was taken over its role by UC Berkeley in 1918 and is now called School of Information. California State Library is still a library for all Californians and the leader of all libraries in California. And the Books for the Blind Division is now continued by Braille and the Talking Book Library, BTBL. As for other departmental changes, we can see it at www.library.ca.gov. Next slide, please. And here is the book newly published and available from CSL Foundation website, cslfdn.org forward slash publications. And we like to make special acknowledgement to editor Gary Kurtz and his team members. Pat Morris and Angela Cotwell. And this is a portrait of Eddie around 1902 by Gibson Art Galleries. 
the next one. And this is the back cover of the book. Ellie G, Harry G. Eddy was in national minority dress, ready for her talk on travel in Soviet Union between 1929 and 1939. Next one, please. And then we also prepared um, two reading lists for your convenience. The first one is a list of um, six titles by Harry G. Eddy. The next one. And then the second one is about Harry G. Eddy and the California County Libraries. And then it is, it is a list of eight titles and it's by no means, they are by no means complete, but they are available through your libraries or through interlibrary loan. And then we list them here, it's just for your reference. And then also because the limitation of our space. Thank you for your patience and your participation. Thank you, Wilon. That was fantastic. Let me get Dr. Buckland back in here. Thank you, Wilan. Uh, I, I hope there's a way that those lists of further reading can be made available. Uh, they lead to other things. So it's a good place to start. Um, I did have one question. Uh, having, having worked up this biographical piece of Harriet Eddy, uh, what, would you, what would you like to do next? Would you want to move on to somebody else or some aspect of the State Library? If you, if you had the time and energy, what, what would you explore next? I probably will explore Gillies, another assistant, Laura Stephens, but there is a lot of challenge for that research project because there's not too much material out there. But I like challenges. And then I try to learn a little bit from uh, Eddie saying of borrowing sunlight from future. So if I feel frustrated, I will try to keep myself very optimistic and I try, if one way is not working, I will try another way to continue my research project. Great. We have some questions in the chat box. Do you want to address some of those? Sure. Okay. So we have um, Yoko asking, how come you firstly got interested in Harriet Eddy? I got interested actually through her mentor and the supervisor, James L. Lewis, because I was um, doing my book project and then uh, Gillis was one of my historical figures. And, I knew at the time what, what he did to California State Library and all the libraries in California. And then later I realized he actually organized the county library system. And the Eddie was, the, was his faithful implementer. And then the more I read into it, the more I got interested as, as a person, as a woman, as we would say. And then she was very, she was a firm believer in education. And then and also education, um, the equality and the equity in education. So that's why she kind of persevered and was tenacious in her efforts to organize the county libraries in California. I, I, I believe that she thought that the education would, would truly benefit those individual counties and, and the way they would get better access to that is, is through the library system, correct? That's correct. That's exactly right. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Dr. Buckland, did you have any more questions? I had a couple of comments. Uh, yeah. I said that it would be interesting to find out more about uh, 
Laura Steffens Suggett, who was the other county library organizer. And I can't resist mentioning the fact that Laura Suggett, Steffens Suggett wrote a little book with a dramatic title, The Beginning and the End of the Best Library Service in the World. And it's an account of what she and Harriet Eddy did with Gillis in mm -hmm. the county library system. It's told in very melodramatic tones. And the truth is that uh, Laura Suggett didn't appreciate uh, James Gillis's successor. And uh, so she felt that he wasn't up to it and he wasn't doing it the right way. So that's why she put in her book, the beginning and the end of the best library service in the world. It's, it's, it's a great read, it really is. The other thing that's fun about Eddie is that she, she really was an activist during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine that anybody in the height of the Cold War who persisted in trying to go behind the Iron Curtain to improve libraries got the attention of the FBI. And in the end, her, her passport was confiscated. Now, Eddie's papers are in the State Library. There's, there's just boxes and boxes and boxes of them. But they include letters that she wrote back to her friends marked top secret and don't tell anybody. And she would announce to the world that she was going to Sweden on vacation. But when she got to Sweden, she would check into a hotel and then the next day she'd disappear by rail to Bulgaria or Czechoslovakia somewhere and uh, uh, would either, she pretended she'd not gone anywhere and she would either not report, write any letters back until she got home, or she would type these letters with capital letters, do not tell anybody about this, and describe where she went. Uh, she had very strong left-wing views, and during the Cold War, it was predictable that uh, uh, she would get into trouble. But she was But she persisted. The same, the same happened with Philip Keeney in Japan. Uh, he was summarily discharged uh, as, a, uh, as a security risk uh, because the chief of security uh, in the Allied occupation was a German fascist who'd uh, adopted his mother's English mother's surname, General Charles Willoughby, a great admirer of the uh, fascist regime in Spain, and he thought Mussolini was wonderful, and anybody left of center was a lefty and should be expelled and disappeared. And that's, that's what happened to Philip Keeney. He was discharged without an honorable discharge, became unemployable, and died a broken man. We have another question from the chat room. Um, Amy would like to know, was the California State Library the primary resource for your research or did you use other resources too? This is the question I actually was asked yesterday by one of my colleagues. Um, I think I got the best advisor in the world and then who um, advised me to go back to the basics to check the news notes of California libraries. And this advice is Dr. Buckland. And then I really, I really buckled down, right, to do the research. And then from there, I also um, dis uh, discovered all the, the original text of the legislatures. And I also, um, I also use a lot of uh, U.S. like um, the uh, um, the, uh, the population data, everything. So to pinpoint where like her sister died and her niece, that kind of a primary information. But news notes is very a great publication. It was it started 
and the which are ed edited by Laura Stephens. Aha, uh -huh. that's full circle. Yeah. That's, I, I can add that it, it was a, a magazine put out by the State Library, News Notes of California Libraries. It's available online and it tells you all you could possibly want to know and more about what's happening uh, month by month in California libraries. It's an absolute goldmine and it's available online for anybody to read. Thank you for that reminder. Um, I did want to mention uh, to anybody who hasn't been to the California State Library, our information services department is actually located in a part of the building known as Gillis Hall. And in Gillis Hall is some of the most beautiful architecture you'll ever see, but also a Maynard Dixon mural, which not a lot of people know about. And it's a beautiful mural. It's a room dedicated to Mr. Gillis and all of the fantastic he, work he did as state librarian. It was a, an appreciation to the state librarian that really put the state library in the public's eye. Great. Okay, Renee asked what was the name of the magazine was, and we have new, thank you, Dr. Buckland for putting that in there, and also Amy. Um, anybody else have any questions or comments? Um, do you have any final remarks, uh, Dr. Buckland or Weedon? No, except I'm delighted that uh, this story is getting attention. Yes. The beginning of the 20th century was the high point of notions of efficiency, organization of methods, and scientific uh, management. And this because the modern American management techniques were largely developed by the railroads. They had to because they had such a complicated thing to do and they didn't want locomotives running into each other. Um, and so the design of the California County Library System combined with the, the, the State Library is just a beautiful example of the best of the sort of efficiency and methods mm -hmm. period at a time when everybody bought into it. The idea was that instead of having industrial warfare or class warfare, if you could just be more efficient then there'd be more that could be shared by everybody, that it was a win-win-win situation. Uh, by the time the Depression came along, that wasn't so convincing, but in, in his time, it really was. And it was a beautifully designed system. It was the best in the world. And uh, people who studied public library systems said so. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot, it's not, it's not a well-known story. It deserves to be. Yeah. An awful lot it's, of history focuses on the East Coast or the Midwest. So we've got to put that right, haven't we? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, once again, I'm going to say that Wheelon's publication through the California State Library Foundation is available through our website, cslsdn.org. Please check that out. Also, our last bulletin issue, which was Bulletin 131, does feature Dr. Michael Buckland's article on Philip Keeney, which you can also order through our website. But these are all perks of being a member at the California State Library. I will mention to get a limited edition publication, you have to be a sponsor level or higher member. But to get a normal bulletin you just have to be a member and these come free every quarter as we put them out filled with wonderful articles from authors like Dr. Buckland and Lelon and and you'd be supporting the California State Library and the wonderful librarians that work with us and through us in the county library systems as well so I want to thank you both so much for all the research and work you've done to support not only the California State Library but the library systems in general I couldn't be more appreciative for the research done on Harriet Eddy. She's always been one of my, a woman after my own heart, so to speak. So thank you again, both for joining us tonight. Thank you, Brindy Dahl, for your, for hosting and for your coordination for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely.
Thank you again. And with that, I will end this series of Disc Dear California, and we hope you'll join us again next month on September 23rd, I do believe. It's the last Thursday of the month where we will be joined by the GLBT Historical Society and be learning about the grants that they receive from the California State Library and what they're doing with it. So again, thank you all and have a wonderful night. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.